If parenting was a GPS system, it would probably always say recalculating. That's because the most dangerous hood we'll ever drive through is parenthood. <laughs> now, we can all relate to parents that worry about their kids 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But what if I told you when it came to parenting black male children that in the United States of America, it's much more intense, much more taxing, much more frightening. You see, it's more than just the constant warning about hanging out with a couple of knuckleheads. We're constantly trying to remind them how to walk, talk, maneuver in a society that often prejudges them before they even arrive. Take a look at my gorgeous family photo. And on first glimpse, it looks like just that, a pretty, beautiful family picture. But if you look a little closer, you'll see three African-American males. And did you know that statistics show that one in three African-American males will spend time in prison during his lifetime? One in three. That's why the worry for African-American parents, African-American male parents, is so much more difficult. We're worrying about them no, no matter where they are, even at elite prep schools in New England. For example, I was picking up my son. He was coming home for a quick winter break. And he was coming through the airport, and he was carrying his hockey bag, his book bag, his hockey sticks, looking like a modern-day pack mule. And he was wearing black sweats, black track jacket, and a black hoodie. And as soon as he got to the car door, he pulled it open, and I screamed at him, what are you doing? Why are you wearing that? Why are you coming through the airport like that with a black hoodie on? Are you trying to have someone come over here and harass us? And he said, Dad, I was just trying to cover up my alopecia. I don't like the way my hair looks with all the ball spots. Of course, I felt horrible. And I tried to apologize to him. And then I explained to him why I live in fear. Fear that he might become the next social media hashtag. A fear that was realized by parents of Trayvon Martin, Elijah McClain, and Michael Brown. You see, the black hoodie seemed to indicate that a black male was a threat shortly after the Trayvon Martin incident. And I would submit to you that the brutalization of the African-American male has become normalized. And why do I say that? Well, take a look at the numbers. Go back to 2019. Look at the statistics. African-American males ages 15 to 34 made up just 2% of the population, yet they accounted for 40% of the gun violence deaths. The high school graduation rate for African-American males, 59% of failing grade by all accounts. And oh yeah, that statistic I mentioned just a moment ago. An African-American male born in this country has a one in three chance of spending time in prison. But what if I told you there was something we could do to change that? As parents, we could move the needle for humanity. As we continue to move forward in our society, what if we work together for change? I want to take you back just a moment in time. This adorable little guy was born in 1988. This picture here was taken in preschool. He was about four years old, one of my favorite childhood memories of his. That was his favorite outfit. It was picture day. But fast forward 22 years. Oh, how things change. I was sitting in Cincinnati where we were living at the time, a hot, sticky day, even hotter here in Atlanta. I got a text message on my phone. Didn't recognize either individual in the picture, so I read on. It was a link to a newspaper article. I was reading along, only to find out that it was my son who had been charged in an armed robbery and home invasion. In a drug-induced stupor, he ran into a home in an Atlanta suburb and earned himself 16 felony counts. To make matters worse, he had done it in the city where my wife was the former prosecutor. I mean, as you can imagine, we were just, we were dumbfounded. We were stupefied. We became physically ill, trying to figure out how in the world something like this happens. And we asked ourselves over and over again, why? How did we get here? How does this happen? And so as we thought about it, we couldn't come up with any good answers. The judge asked us the very same question as we moved towards sentencing day. Mr. Hayes, he said, you're not my typical defendant. You had a loving family. You have a village, judging by the number of people here in court to support you. You had a formal education. You had a degree from Howard University. You served on the USS Enterprise in the US Navy. How in the world 
did we get here? And it was a great question. Still, we had no answers. And as we continue to to question ourselves, what did we do wrong, beat ourselves up about it, we tried to move forward, trying to figure out a way to support him, obviously praying for the family that was victimized. Fortunately, none of them was seriously physically injured. We pray that they can get past the trauma. We pray that their lives will someday be whole again. But we still tried to figure out, you know, you got a television newscaster, you, you have an attorney, a former prosecutor as parents, they invest in you, they give you all the things you need to be successful and some of the things you want, yet our child ends up in the belly of the beast, a.k.a. America's prison industrial complex. How in the world does this happen? And, you know, later he would tell us that, you know, we did everything we were supposed to do. And it was all on him, from the music that seduced him, you know, to the opioids that turned him into an unrecognizable shell of himself. But I would argue that it was something much simpler. Because when he cut off contact with us, when he refused to take our calls, when he refused to talk to us, all the positive influences were gone. It all came down to a lack of communication. And it was quite simple, because if you knew Mrs. Hayes, she doesn't play, especially when it came to discipline. Mrs. Hayes does not play. Get your elbows off the table. She's not putting up with it, especially when it came to discipline. So much so that our younger son would become an exemplary student at his prep school, go on to be a dean's list student at the University of Maine, do graduate work at University of Alaska at Anchorage, and now earns his living as a professional hockey player all because of the discipline, all because of the discipline. So we got him on the road to success. We got him on the path to greatness. But somehow, through that lack of communication, things fell apart. Our high hopes were dashed to bits. You know, that lack of communication made it so much easier for those outside influences to penetrate. One son got in trouble, he opened up to us, and we were able to get him the resources that he needed. The other son shut us down, cut us off, and that exacerbated his spiral that led him right toward the belly of the beast, right toward the system's hands, the one thing we fought so hard to try to avoid. So where could we go from here? How could we help? How could we continue to move these men forward, to move these boys forward, dealing with this incredible contrast, this stark reality, and battle those outside influences too? Let's talk about those influences for a moment, particularly the music. You know, there's an old blog post that's getting a lot of attention during the pandemic. And basically, the author writes that he attended a meeting right outside Los Angeles back in 1991. The purpose of the meeting was for these five or six guys that were running the meeting to inform 25 to 30 of the top record label executives that their record labels had made a huge investment in the prison industry, the private prison industry. And their jobs from now on was to help keep the prisons full help keep the prisons full by signing those destructive gangster rap acts with those destructive lyrics. And within months, the author says, the plan worked. He noticed that fun-loving, <laughs> storytelling hip-hoppers like Fresh, Fresh Prince, a.k.a. Will Smith, Kid and Play, going by the wayside, socially conscious rappers like Public Enemy, X-Clan, Poor Righteous Teachers, going by the wayside, and gangster rap lyrics dominating the airways. And the devious goal had now come to fruition. It was working because you had young people unable to process a steady diet of deviance and destruction all set to a funky beat. I mean, the male brain doesn't fully develop until 26 years old. And now you have young people emulating what they saw and heard, it reminded me of a conversation I had with one of my older son's teammates. He said, Mr. Hayes, you know, when Kenny listened to the music, it was like he was in a trance. It was scary the way it moved him. We should have done more. And so when you continue to think about these outside influences, you think about the ripple effect. Go back to 1990, we had about 700,000 people incarcerated in the U.S. Right now, we have 2.3 million. We are the world's most prolific warehousing agent of human beings. One in four of the world's prisoners resides right here in the United States of America. We make up 5% of the world's population, 25% of the prison population. I would argue we can't be the greatest country on earth 
and be the best when it comes to warehousing human beings and holding them captive. There has to be a better way to, to, to find an economic model. I mean, the output of prison industrial goods and services is somewhere around $2 billion now woven into the fabric of our economy, into the fabric of our society. Idaho potatoes, if you've ever had one, that comes directly from prison labor. So we think about it as we move forward and we just try to find ways that we can battle these outside influences as parents. What if we all came together and started working toward building a kinder, gentler generation of kids that understands that there is no value in oppressing other human beings, that doesn't see value in a system that hands out justice based on economic status or the color of your skin. You know, after my son's ordeal, I started looking at the stories behind the stories in a lot of these tragedies. And I could um, look at the Minnesota uh, racial population and the makeup there. And it was 83% white, 6% black. And then when you look at the prison population in the state of Minnesota, African Americans account for 40% of the prison population. It seems a little out of whack. On Tuesday, voters in Minnesota just went to the polls and voted down police reform. They think we don't need change. I would argue that we need a kinder, gentler generation of kids with parents teaching them lessons of love, kindness, and understanding. I think it's time for us as parents to show our kids how to get to know our neighbors again. And not just the neighbors that look like us. Let's get to know the neighbors that don't look like us. Because we're only afraid of things that are foreign to us, things we don't understand, things we don't know. Imagine the possibilities if we came together as a collective and started to work together and found unity in our community. Imagine the possibilities. I mean, if you think about it, it's really not that difficult to be kind to someone and to teach our kids the same thing. So as we move forward during these trying days past the summer of social, social justice and we figure out ways to try to connect with one another, We've got to look at, our, look, at, look at ways that we can come together. If you can't go on your phone right now and find someone of another ethnicity or cultural background, then I would say it's time for all of us to broaden our horizons and imagine the possibilities. Imagine what we could do if one-third of our human capital didn't have to waste away in prison, if we diverted some of that $80 billion that we spend every year on incarceration. Imagine if it went to education. And, and health and wellness programs for those who need it most. Not just African-American kids, but all kids. Take a look at some of the possibilities. I mean, Victor Glover, a NASA astronaut, the first African-American male to ever set foot on the International Space Station. Or Chadwick Boseman, a Howard University grad, who changed the way we look at superheroes with his portrayal of the Black Panther. Or Stefan Alexander from the Boogie Down Bronx. He's a theoretical physicist and an Ivy League professor at Brown University. These are the possibilities. Imagine if this became the expectation instead of the exception. Imagine what our communities would look like if we tried to connect on a deeper level, tried to find more understanding. And you ask, how do we do it? Where does it start? Where do we begin? Well, I would submit we could start at work. We could create an internship program and create opportunities for African-American males. We could mentor a young African-American male or a member of another ethnicity. Plenty of great organizations around the country to help you achieve that goal. You could attend an African-American church. You'd learn a lot about the African-American community by just attending church service. You'll definitely learn what's going on in the black community because we tell it all in church. <laughs> or if that's not enough, you want to do something a little more transformative, how about running a prison ministry? How about a Bible study at a prison ministry? You'd be surprised how much people behind bars will share with you. If that's too much, log on to your favorite streaming platform. Every major platform has an African-American experience section, and there's plenty to choose from. Still too much? What about Amazon? One click, you could have an amazing book on the black experience in the United States delivered right to your doorstep. What I'm saying is, please, please, Share with your kids the rich heritage of African-Americans and other cultures with them. Because the only time we cheer for black males can't be in a crowded stadium on a Saturday afternoon. I think we can do better. 
We can do better. We have so much more to offer. And as we move forward, I would just like you to think about what our communities would look like if we were kinder, if we were gentler, if we were more understanding of one another, what the possibilities could be. And so I'll ask you to indulge me for just a moment because, you know, our family, our family believes, believes in being dream builders, not dream killers. What, would I, what kind of father would I have been if I had killed my youngest son's dream of playing in the NHL? and told him that, yeah, you know, you probably are not going to enjoy white folks. <laughs> I don't know when the last time you checked in the NHL, but there ain't a whole lot of brothers on NHL rosters. <laughs> I'm just saying. But it doesn't matter to him because he considers himself a hockey player, period. End of story. And my family and I also believe in accountability and personal responsibility and the fact that this young man must pay for the actions that he has taken. But we believe that setbacks are just great opportunities for comebacks. And we're rooting for him. And I want you to root for him too, because we're only as good as our weakest link. So ladies and gentlemen, come with me, if you will, for just a moment. Close your eyes and think about three men in your family that you know, love, and adore. And imagine you had to sacrifice one of those men to the prison industrial complex. Would those odds be acceptable to you, or would you fight like hell to effect change? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking you to come with me to break the cycle, join me on the journey, to change the face of the future, to rid us of the reality that one in three African-American boys will spend time in prison. And I'll leave you with this, a simple quote from Bob Carey that simply says, unexpected kindness is the most powerful, least costly, and most underrated agent of human change. And I wonder what kind of world we would live in if we put kindness, compassion, and connection at the center of all our relationships. Thank you.